Well, they're far away from us in Australia, so I'm going to assume it's safe to talk about them without them knowing. But John and Darlene Smith, whom some of you know, have a fantastic birthing story to tell, and it's best to have Darlene tell it. And it involves John catching one of their babies in the parking lot of the hospital. That's a very unfortunate verb, isn't it? Catching a baby, you picture a, a catcher's mitt or something like that. It really doesn't work like that, as I understand it. <laughs> Women sometimes get together to exchange birthing stories, and the men pretend to be uninterested. But if the truth be told, we find these stories to be quite interesting. In fact, birthing stories are interesting enough to be put on TV. There's money to be made off them. I don't know if there's still a program on TV, but some time ago there was a program on TLC called Birthing Stories, where you could follow a particular woman through the sequence. The birthing story of Jesus is really, in many ways, a heartwarming and endearing story. We have this young girl, 15 years old probably, making this journey with her fiancé from one place to another place, coming to this town called Bethlehem, not finding a place there where she can rest her head and having to go out to the animal quarters with her husband to give birth to their first child. And she takes this little baby and she lovingly wraps him in swaddling cloths, the Bible tells us, and places him, places him in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. And then all of these colorful characters celebrate the birth of this baby. There are shepherds, and there are angels, there are wise men from the East. It really is a heartwarming and endearing story. And yet, this morning I want to peel off that layer, that surface reading of the text, so that we see another dimension to the birth story of Jesus and when we peel off that superficial layer, which is so endearing and heartwarming, we see that the birthing story of Jesus confronts us. The birthing story of Jesus, in some ways, is threatening. It confronts us with some of the most important questions in the world. Questions like, who's really in charge of the world? Who is the true king who can bring true peace in the world? And as we begin to make our way through chapter 2 of Luke's gospel, we see that there's a clash here between two kingdoms. There's a confrontation between two kings. Kings with alternative kingdoms, alternative glories, they both promise to bring peace. Only one of those kings can deliver on the promise. The text begins with the one kingdom, represented by Caesar Augustus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. We immediately think of ancient history of the Roman Empire, of the powerful Caesars. We have to ask ourselves the question, why does Luke give us this information? Is he just being descriptive for literary purposes? Is he just adding these details about historical context to enhance the story and make it even a little more interesting? We need to see this morning that Luke, in giving us this information, is giving us information we need to know. It's significant information for understanding the story. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree, and we imagine a man whose word is power. We imagine a ruler who speaks and things happen, an individual who issues commands and people obey, a powerful figure. Well, who is this Caesar Augustus? He's an individual who's well known to ancient historians. His birth name was Octavian. He's the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And all of you who are in high school know who Julius Caesar is because you've studied it in high school. Please tell me, Mr. Vimpop, that they still study Julius Caesar, and they do. The adopted son of Julius Caesar, who became a general in the Roman Empire at a time when the Roman Republic was severely weakened because of piracy and because of civil wars and because of violence. And yet as he rose to power, he transformed the Republic into a massive empire that stretched from Gibraltar all the way to Jerusalem, from Britain all the way to the Black Sea. It was a magnificent empire. And under the reign of Caesar Augustus, the Roman Empire enjoyed what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, because the civil wars ended and the roads became safe. Piracy was stopped. The gangs were dismissed. It was a wonderful time. And in the year 27 BC, the Roman Senate, acknowledging what Octavian had done, gave him the name Augustus, which means exalted one, worthy of honor, majestic. And it was a name that Octavian welcomed, Caesar Augustus. He declared that his adoptive father, Julius, was divine, such that if you were to go throughout the Roman Empire and ask anyone in any place within the Roman Empire who the Son of God is, they would almost undoubtedly say, Caesar Augustus, the Son of of the divine. The Romans sang his praises, called him in one writing a savior, said the beginning of his rule was, again I quote, the beginning of the gospel. That's how his rule was described by contemporaries. He was lauded, he was worshiped, he was honored. Here in our text, Luke calls him not the emperor, but Caesar Augustus. I find that interesting because the gospel of Luke isn't the only book that Luke wrote. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts, he refers to emperors. But there, he doesn't refer to the emperors by their names, but just as emperor in most cases, general terms. But here we get his name, Caesar Augustus, the worthy one, the exalted one. Pontifex Maximus, another title he assumed for himself, chief priest, savior of the world. And the powers of Caesar Augustus are everywhere apparent in this text because he orders a census. And the moment he issues the decree, the wheels of bureaucracy begin to turn and things happen. People obey. Clerks get busy writing down lists of names, of occupations, of possessions. We want to know how many servants the Roman Empire has. We want to know how much we can tax these people. We want to know how all of these people can somehow contribute to the glory of the Roman Empire. We want all of this information. Verse 3, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So the text begins with the story of a powerful emperor, and yet within the story of this powerful emperor, there's a story of a little, seemingly insignificant baby. And the question, as I said, that Luke wants us to ask as we read through the story is who is the true king? Who's really in charge of the world? 
who runs this world and who can truly bring peace. Well, you say it has to be Caesar Augustus. He's the one with all the power. He's the one who's introduced the Pax Romana. He's the one that's brought stability to the Roman Empire. He's the one who's transformed the Republic into an empire. And yet within days, we discover that maybe Caesar Augustus isn't the all-powerful one. Because within days, you have heavenly hosts singing praises for the birth of this child. Caesar Augustus, you see, may command the great armies of Rome, but the armies of heaven are on the side of the child. And something of that significance is even hinted at in our text. And the way it begins in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree The birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is not dated by the census of Augustus. The the census of Augustus is dated by the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree calling for a census. What days? The days when the Lord was preparing for the birth of the child. There we see the one who has the real power. And it turns out that Caesar Augustus is merely a pawn on the Lord's chessboard. But what about this other king? What about the little baby who's just born? Well, we need to know something about his father. So often I think our focus is on Mary when we think about the parents of Jesus, but in the Gospels, the spotlight is often on Joseph. And why is that? It's because he's of the house and the lineage of David. He is of the house and the lineage of great King David, Israel's greatest king. He is the heir apparent to the throne of David. Well, what has become of the house of David? The house of David has been thoroughly humiliated, hasn't it? There's nothing left of it. The great tree of David has been reduced to a stump. It's embarrassing. The line of David has been reduced to this Galilean carpenter who is a pawn on Caesar Augustus's chessboard. He speaks and Joseph moves Where does Joseph go to? The text tells us where he leaves and where he goes. He leaves from, he leaves Nazareth and goes to a place. And the significance of this place is mentioned, interestingly, before the name of the place. He goes to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting? doesn't say he goes to Bethlehem, which is the city of David. The heir apparent goes to the city of great King David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, I suspect if I were to ask you, if you're familiar somewhat with the Bible's message, if I were to ask you the question, what is the city of David? Many of you would probably say Jerusalem. That's the city from which David reigned. And yet here, Bethlehem is called the city of David. Jerusalem is under the control of Herod, who is the king of Judea. Bethlehem is the place that David left behind when he went on to bigger and better things. And yet the name Bethlehem recalls this great promise, doesn't it, that we find in the prophecy of Micah. But out of Bethlehem would come a ruler who would govern and the strength of the Lord, whose kingdom would stretch to the ends of the earth. Here's the exciting thing. There's a little secret in the humiliated house of David. And Luke lets us know the little secret. 
Joseph registers, verse 5, with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And we know who that child is because Gabriel told Mary, Luke 1, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. And when Joseph registers his family in our text, he registers this child under his name, he's willing to make to take Mary's child and adopt that child as his own so that he is of the house and the lineage of David, the heir to the throne of great King David, to be the one who will rescue the people from their enemies and send Emperor Augustus into obscurity. So the story that's told in our text is a story of two kings. One powerful king who is now old. Augustus turned 60 in the year that Jesus was born. A powerful individual who brought a measure of peace and stability to the world. Somebody who valued family values. Somebody who valued modesty. In an age when people were living ostentatious lifestyles. Historians will tell you that Caesar Augustus exiled his daughter from Rome because of her hedonistic lifestyle. He would not tolerate it. And yet we discover that Caesar Augustus was a ruthless individual. And the best comparison that I can come up with is Saddam Hussein, who brought peace to Iraq but was ruthless in so doing, bought peace at the price of bloodshed. That's Caesar Augustus. But we also have the other king, the young king, laid in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths, born in poverty. And he's going to present the alternative kingdom that has alternative glory. And he's going to bring peace into the world through sacrifice. And he came not to be served, as Caesar Augustus did, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to suffer over the course of his life and then to die that ignoble death to pay for our sins, to reconcile us to the Father from whom we were estranged, and to bring peace where there was enmity. And in dying, the Bible says he defeated the powers of evil, was laid in the tomb, and three days later rose from the grave, ascended into heaven. And where did he go when he ascended into heaven? Peter tells us in Acts 2, in the sermon he preached at Pentecost, he went to sit on the throne of his father, David, as King Jesus, coronated king over the whole world. Caesar Augustus thought he had power, and you know Pontius Pilate, the representative of Caesar, who surfaces towards the end of Jesus' life, the climax of Luke's gospel. Pontius Pilate had delusions of grandeur. And you remember Jesus said to him, you would have no power at all unless it were given to you by my Father in heaven. Jesus has the power, all authority in heaven and in earth, he says in Matthew 28, has been given to me. He is the true king. He is the king who loves his people. He is the king who loves you. He is the king who's not going to kill others to bring peace. He is the king who's going to sacrifice himself to bring peace. He's the king whose authority is universal. 
He is the king who doesn't die. The birthing story of Jesus, like many birthing stories, is heartwarming and endearing. I want you to see with me this morning that it's also threatening and it's confrontational and it brings to the surface those big questions we need to face. Who's really in charge of the world? Who is the true king? Who is the king who can bring true peace? The gospels tell us Jesus is that king. Love him, trust him, serve him, enjoy the peace he has purchased and promote the peace of the Prince of Peace. Amen. Let's pray together. Loving God and the world today, we still see those threatening powers that purport to bring peace, but use the shedding of blood to accomplish it. We see those powers promising stability but attaining stability through usurping power, through seizing, through dictating. We thank you that you sent your son to be the true king of the world. The king who comes not to be served, but to serve. The king who brings peace by sacrificing himself. We thank you this morning for your love and for his love. And we pray that you would help us in our lives to promote that kingdom of peace, governed by the Prince of Peace. Help us to be peaceful people in acknowledgement of the peace that we enjoy through the work of our Savior, born on Christmas Day. And we pray that you would bless us throughout this day so that the songs we sing this morning and the joy we have today carry us through. Bless us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.